The end of Thorfinn's innocence begins a new chapter of pain and history. See, I don't know anything about history, so I don't know how this is going to go. It's pretty high up. Wow. Is this the Sleepy King we've seen in the intro? Let's top out there for mercenaries. Gotta go where the work is. <laughs> All the good villages are gone. Lots of birds. And there's always war somewhere. Friends should have known. Yeah, a lot of good food to be had here. Everyone graduated that day. This another day in the Pirate Corps. Yeah, Thorfinn seems to have become vital to this whole operation. Oh, he's big now! Definitely has a presence. He's still kind of tiny though. Yeah, the last episode seems to have made a definitive statement about him closing a chapter in his life or leaving it behind, at least for now. The woman who took him in last episode felt like the last hope in a way. That was him rejecting family, even if it was done kind of passively. I keep thinking about that episode. Like, it was really haunting just to see that kind of kindness, that good heartedness disappear and just realizing that in that context, it never really stood a chance for the woman and also for, for Thorfinn just being in this world, being in this life, starting out the way he did. In a way, different from Thor's, she was kind of this idealism without strength, if that makes sense. This vague wish that things could be different against just the brute force of the invading pirates. Whereas Thor's chose his fate and, you know, could have chose differently. She sort of had no, no hope. She just got rolled over. She represents the tragedy of, you know, wishing well and hoping that evil will go away and then just coming face to face with it as an unstoppable force. You know, this is sort of the, the problem with just believing in goodness without actually being able to affect it. People who want to do you harm are not bound by the same conventions and so they kind of force you to play their game and if you don't have the strength to, to fight it then you really don't stand a chance unless your goal is just purely ideological and is willing to dispense with your own survival. That's why I think a lot of times in shows and just in life I guess heroism doesn't resign itself to a wish. It has to be the, the ideology and the values with a certain level of effectiveness or capability. Episode 7, Partner in War. <laughs> Starting off with an insult, the true path to good negotiations. <laughs> Ask that is really great at leading his men. Damn, this guy's grizzled. When do I get the duel? <laughs> I think one of the reasons why Aslad does not have a lot of fear of Thorfinn is that he correctly identifies that Thorfinn needs this more than he realizes. He's deeper than he knows. It's so bizarre that they all speak Japanese. <laughs> the legend precedes them. Through the front door. We're water people. I'm so curious how it's going to go down between Thorfinn and Asklad. I don't think Thorfinn has any concept of what's actually going on. The whole Asklad revenge thing is just something he put in front of him to keep him going because he just couldn't possibly comprehend everything that he's seen. Even the, the carnage he him, himself has participated in, it's all just going to be buried layer after layer. And to the point where it, even if he gets revenge on Asklad, it's going to be a terrible thing for him. It will solve nothing because it will just force him to confront what he's been avoiding this whole time. This is a very dramatic story and is 
sort of epic in its scope, but that's just always true, you know? We'll have all these these fears and anxieties and they're just way too complex and deep to address one by one, or we don't know how to. So rather than do that, we kind of affix some concrete goal or task that is supposed to imbue meaning into the rest of it and, you know, kind of be a panacea for all our ills, but it inevitably won't be. Only addressing those things one by one and the underlying assumptions that compose them is going to bring any kind of closure. Part of the reason why it's not a good idea to do anything that feels wrong for any goal, because you'll find out that you'll you'll get what you want, but it wasn't really what you wanted, and now you have just this this history to live with. Thorfinn is such a massive storm coming, it's unreal. They really, you know, went out of their way to make this military leader super sympathetic. Just like Jesus would have wanted. Sieging this fortress. It's very interesting that he says it's a memento of his father. His father, like, shed blood trying to stop him from picking up the knife. Show you how Vikings do waterfalls. Damn, that is badass. Are they sailing their Viking ship up a mountain? Or are they carrying it? This guy even puts Attack on Titan inner circle people, people's access to shame. They're already in. Watch the gates just open. At least he's actually on the battlefield. <laughs> even this, this guy, this glutton, puts modern leaders to shame. It's a very handsome lot. Speaking of leadership. Is that hot dung? Hot feces, the ultimate attack. Ooh, watch how it's done. Wait, what? That's a terrible idea. A little communication would have made this a little easier. <laughs> a little safer. They're just running with the Viking boat. Oh, they showed up behind them? Or are they getting both of them at once? What's what's their game? Alright, they didn't kill him. Well, you said you wanted to see a Viking ship. There it is, up close. He is the dragon. <laughs> He's so cool. He's just riding it on land. Asphalt's having a great time. Wow, just jumps the whole moat. Watch out for the hot feces. They have so much battle charisma, just their very presence it inspires confidence. Never expected anyone to carry a boat over land. We're cool. We're good. He's so steely. He really uses the childhood angle. They get paralyzed when they first see him. Nope, that's my boy. I wonder if Asglad realizes how much Thorfinn means to him. There's gonna be some of that going on too, right? Oof. And he catches the sword. And now he's big enough to wield it. Nice first person POV. That's slow though. <laughs> you can see where his priorities are. But what happens when he gets his duel? All in all, it was a great vacation from war. Enjoying our winter time off, winter break. Vacation's all I ever wanted. <laughs> they live up to the myth. This guy's just so likable. So likable. So great. That's bold to think you can betray them. And that's how the Asglad crew defeated two armies. Very subtle. <laughs> 
<laughs> they don't need to share. They don't need to do anything. Speaking of having or needing the force to back things up, they basically set their their morality themselves. I mean, but I mean, they won the war, won the battle, so. <laughs> That's me anytime I get in trouble abroad. Selective understanding. Mm. I'm wondering, like, if that's actually how he feels. It's gotta be something, right? Something in there? Dual time. Thug's head. Asklad did promise. Maybe not right now. I really wanted some insight into what Asklad's thinking right now. What's going through his mind? <laughs> this is them not being scared. Yep, just, you know, breezily sailing down a waterfall. Yeah, what now? I feel like we're gonna learn a lot about Aslat's priorities. I've been wondering about this for a while. What he's actually after. I mean, they could just retire. Do Vikings retire? Thorfinn might retire him. It seems like he just loves doing what he does. Whoa, that episode just blew right by. As they do. The duel itself carries with it so much fate in it. I mean, Thorfinn's gonna live. He's not gonna die in the seventh or eighth episode, but a lot will come to a head for him in terms of his quest. Either he defeats Asklad and is just kind of lost to be scooped up by the winds of fate, you know, whatever rolls around next that allows him to keep kicking this can of misery down the road, or he realizes that this is kind of his life. There's also a chance that Asklad asking Thors to lead them was a bit of foreshadowing. It's, I guess, possible that Thorfinn could end up leading Asklad's crew even, though he does seem a little bit green for that right now. There's just so many ways this is, can go. I, I'm like mo most interested to see what happens for Thorfinn emotionally as a result of this, and what happens to his stated intent and goal. The kid is in deep deep feces, deep hot feces in terms of his life path. He's got a very long climb out of this if he ever manages. This seems to be one of those situations where you gotta go down, like all the way down before he can start going up again. He doesn't realize how much everything he's doing is just dictated by the authority of the world around him. And most people, and especially kids, are just gonna answer to that authority and, you know, think they're independent or overestimate the extent to which they are independent actors, you know, thoughtful, willing participants. I mentioned that I've seen kids lost to different kinds of authority in their lives, deviating from what usually plays that role, you know, like parents and teachers in society. This is a very, very mundane example compared to the show, but there was a time where I was teaching in China that I got put in charge of what I guess was the, the troubled class because the previous two teachers had quit the role. And it was a bizarre setup to begin with because the class had six kids in it when classes usually have 30 kids. And the whole reason for that class's existence was not to help those kids, but to like get them away from everyone else that people still had hope for. But basically there was just nothing I could appeal to that would make any kind of difference because they had ceded all moral authority to their peers and to their own desires. There's no authority I have as a person just because they had already given up all faith in the infrastructure of the school and any kind of conduct or niceties that are that were involved with that. They pushed things to their logical limit, which is, you know, if you really think about it, teachers and parents don't have any control over teenagers if they're not afraid of the emotional fallout. And no one had any expectations on them in terms of grades. Also, frustratingly, they were basically guaranteed a future because they could buy their way in. They definitely didn't need to learn English, you know? It was rough, you know, they didn't observe any of the rules. They told me all sorts of horrible, horrible things about the female students. Fights broke out and it's difficult as a teacher to know where the lines are there. It was just bad, it was bad. Basically impossible to do anything constructive. And I tried everything, you know, I tried toughness, I tried like getting to know them outside of the class and like playing basketball with them and stuff. But you know, if there's no willingness there, if there's no regard for a common set of boundaries or guidelines, you really can't engage with that past a certain point and you sort of just have to resign yourself to doing what you know how and being honorable in that and not being dragged into it yourself. And I'll add another layer of craziness to this, which I probably never have articulated to anyone, even to myself. But there was something really charismatic about it to the point where I actually felt myself getting sucked in. It's like, what does it matter what we're doing curriculum wise? They've clearly disregarded it. One really genius thing they did too was 
was they never disrespected me as a person. They disrespected me as a teacher plenty, but they actually wanted me to join their world. You know, they were trying to confide in me the, their drama and their gossip and basically were trying to lure me into crossing key lines as a teacher. And there's something really powerful about seeing people who have entered that slipstream of their own self-generating source of utility and vision and goals, even if it's super flawed. You know, it's similar to watching gangster movies. You know that the gangsters are terrible, but there's something so appealing and alluring about the fact that they are, at least on the surface, people who are very connected to their own lives and are able to get things that are highly valued despite having cast off some of the, the shackles of the rules. So I basically just stomached it and did my best for a year. By far the hardest period of my life as a teacher. But I say all that to say one of the things that, that drilled home for me is that a lot of things that you, you take for granted, a lot of your feelings of effectual effectualness in the world are reliant on a set of operating principles, you know, a common game being played. And there are definitely people and there's an element of life where the rules can be dispensed with people figure it out that actually there's nothing real binding them there's no threat or the answer to a higher threat or a higher call which for these kids was they were very much involved in the lives they had outside of school and their little crew and whatever it was they were getting up to that had a higher emotional weight and value and perhaps a higher correlated fear than anything that teachers their teachers or parents could deliver in that state it's kind of a terrifying feeling as an observer because you realize how much of that you've been counting on how much of your relative safety and the things you rely on, the, the sense of peace that you have established is not in your control. It's relying on other people continuing to hold that up, to uphold that. And also realizing that you can't save people from that state. They're just gonna go down that path if they so choose, unless you know they, they have their own sort of awakening based on whatever experience or the right words or something. And you know the full trajectory, you know, you've been through it. You see exactly where it leads. You know that that's gonna dry up for them. And you, you know, you have hope they'll get it someday. You wish you could spare them from having to go down that path when they don't need to, but you know, it's their journey but that's sort of the feeling i get from thorfinn just at a much darker scale because there's just no authority at all with which to hold him back here it's not that woman right the woman who tried to incorporate him in her life give you know treating him like a son calling him johnny which is probably too much but giving him a warm home that's meaningless in the face of what he's experienced in the wake of his father's death. Him living in this crew of just absolute badass renegades who get whatever they want, take whatever they want, are super competent, never at a lack for anything except for hygiene, have super charisma, they give up this feeling of really being alive and being realized even though they're they're dispensing with all sorts of values in order to, to be there. What hope does anyone have? You know, what hope does the vague memory of Thor's have for Thorfinn, especially after watching Thor's die as a result of it? What hope does this random lady, village lady, have in pulling him back from the brink? His quiet mom and his somewhat detached sister, part of what makes his life right now so dynamic is that these are his enemies, but they're also sort of the highest thing he, he has in his life right now. They're the strongest people he has in his life. They're the only people who are thriving and they're the only people giving him any sort of attention or affection. And they're giving him that precisely because of the terrible things he's doing because it feeds right into their whole ethos. I even felt that pull as an adult, you know? Thorfinn has no shot as a kid. I don't know, he doesn't really stand a chance, which is why it's gonna be so crazy to see how this goes down next episode. I can't wait.